All right, you guys, got a beauty, absolute beauty to share with you uh, this morning. So, um, so 15 plus 10, this is what I'm playing at the moment. I'm really focusing on um, how to, the importance of winning. I've got to learn how to win games. Um, and I think having any hard deadline, I mean, even, I've won 30 minute games by flagging my opponent, right? And that's not the same. It's not the same as winning. Because what I want to do is I want to develop the ability to checkmate my opponent or to force my opponent to resign. Flagging is just a completely different thing. And that's what playing blitz and even like 10 minute rapid and stuff will teach you. So I'm really now going for the, for the increment and it's going to force me to play better. I've said this for a while. Um, I really, really do believe it's true. And, and the, the increment kind of almost plays a, a key role in this game, as you'll see. So the other thing that it teaches you as well is that it teaches you to use more of your time in the opening and the middle game, I think, to try and secure yourself an advantage going into the end game. And that's very, very important for chess. You know, if you're going to play classical competition, tournament, over the board stuff, you need to be able to really focus down on how am I going to get a winning position in the end game, right? And then you might have 10 seconds on the clock, but if you've got a 10 second increment, then, you know, we've all done it, right? We've all, we've all lost games when our opponent's got almost no time on the clock, but has an advantage and there's an increment and they just wipe the floor because <laughs> their clock is actually going up, whereas ours is going down. Anyway, <clears throat> so, so Frodo Swaggins watched this game and, and sent me an emoji. That's nice. Okay, so um, this, is, this one's in the Icelandic Palm Gambit. And this is part of my repertoire right now against E4. So I've got the black pieces. My opponent's rated 1430-odd and from Iran. So we have E4. And I've now gone back to the Scandi because there's uh, fun and games to be had in the Scandi. All right. And, and plus, you know, people don't, face it all the time it's not terribly popular um so e takes d5 is the correct move now knight to f6 so rather than than queen takes and getting into all that funny business with queen here or queen coming back here or queen coming back here um i'm playing this as the modern variation of the scandinavian and there's a few approaches the the best move on the whole as you say is d4 just ignore the pawn right um but we might see knight out here, in which case generally we might trade knights and bring the queen out. And we've got slight advantage, arguably, of having the queen out on the board who can't be kicked by queen's knight because it's off the board. Um, this is the dull line with the king's knight coming out. And that's very boring. Um, so I need to explore that a bit more. But this is common. This is very common at the beginner and intermediate level, trying to hang on to the pawn. Now, what we do here is we push the king's pawn to e6 and say to white, look, this is very kind of, it's too advanced up the board. It's already doubled up on the d file. You might as well just swap it off. And very, very often white will just swap it off. And now what we do is we capture with the bishop. Okay. And look, so what we've done is and this is really important to understand the mindset of the gambit player, right? When you play a gambit, so my opponent now has, play, has moved that pawn three times, okay? So what has he got to show for his first four moves, right? So he's played pawn, yeah? Pawn takes, defends, pawn takes again, pawn disappears, okay? So that king's pawn with its three moves those three moves have now evaporated they're off the board okay however for black i've got two pieces out in the board right so i have a development score of two against zero now then it becomes really important i what i have to do now is i have to prove that my um gamble is worth it, right? So what I, I, I've made a trade here, I've made a, tr a pact with the devil, right? I've given up a pawn in material in return for 
and a, a lead in development. Now, if I just then sit back and coast and allow my opponent to develop, you know, um, in comfort and in his own pace, then my my advantage will evaporate and his advantage of having an extra pawn on the board may prove to be decisive later on. So I can't do that. So what you've got to do when you play gambits like this is you've got to keep the pressure on. You've got to prevent your opponent uh, very often from castling, prevent your opponent from developing in, an, in a natural way. <clears throat> Just keep him always trying to react against your moves. And that's easier because you've got some you've got this development lead right so you can use your advantage in development use the the fact that you've got more control over squares on the board to make life harder for your opponent and in this game it uh, that's very much what I'm able to do he now plays d3 which is an odd one and wasn't even in my notes right so you know when, when I come across a move that I don't recognize I go, okay, well, there's got to be something dodgy about this move. Um, now, so I didn't think that sacking the bishop here in, and then trading queens, forcing the king to move is worth it. I'm already down a pawn. In this case, I would get a pawn, but I'd be an entire bishop down. And what would I have to show for it? White loses casting rights. I don't think that's worth a bishop. I think it's worth a pawn. I don't think it's worth a bishop. So that's not it. So there must be something wrong with this move. So what I what I did was I, I kind of went reverted to uh, default, which is queen e7. And this is a very, very typical idea. In a way, you're almost kind of trying to trick your opponent into thinking that you want to castle long, which very often you will want to do. When you've got an open d-file, castling queenside makes a load of sense because your rook gets straight on the d-file and prepares to cause trouble. But in reality, what you're doing is you're setting up a discovered check, right? So this bishop could grab that pawn for free because white would be in check by my queen and he'd have to block the check somehow, all right? And then ends up with an isolated queen's pawn and we've got our pawn back and pretty much proven that our gambit's paid off. My opponent twinked this because he's no fool and uh, blocked pre-blocked the discovered check with his bishop and now I have a little think and what you have to do in these situations is you have to stay on the front foot so yeah you know there's ideas of this but then bishop comes to here and my queen well, I suppose could grab that pawn so uh, maybe knight here or knight here would simply block the check and um all I've done there is I've just allowed white to develop and I really don't want to do that. So I develop knight c6. So the knight has ideas of coming in here, putting pressure on this bishop, for example. White develops a, a knight as well. Now, my concern here is I don't want white to castle. I want to keep the pressure on, okay? So long castles. Now look at this. One, two, three, four, and castled six. Okay, I have a lead in development of six to two. And this bishop is still um, pinned. Now, if this queen moves, the king will be the only defender of, of the bishop. So I think there's an argument to say that maybe white should have castled here. What white does, decides to do is this. Now, the problem with that is the queen's just moved and vacated the abandoned the defense of this bishop. So this bishop is now defended only by the king, and that means white can't castle, because it undefends the bishop, right? And should my bishop move, my queen might just grab it. So, <clears throat> now it's time to maintain the pressure. So we've just said, if my bishop moves, right, then my queen's looking at that, and the king is then tied to the defense of the bishop. Okay, so I had a think here for nearly two minutes, right? I'm on 14 minutes 56 right now. It's just gone fairly smoothly, first few moves. This is the time to start thinking, and we absolutely do start thinking. Okay, bishop d7. So here, what I'm threatening is, for example, knight d4, discovered attack on the queen, right? Two attackers on the bishop. 
and the queen can't defend the bishop here, she'd have to come all the way back to there, right? Because there and there will be guarded by my knight. So that would force the queen to retreat all the way back here and, and lose time, okay? So the queen comes back to here now, right? Um, now I can't play this move because simply knight takes, right? So that's not on. So I think again, um, for another minute, knight b4, right? Hit the queen again. So I'm going, I'm going hit, 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 you know, flicking him in the eye. He's got to keep reacting, got to keep moving. My opponent's already down to 10 minutes here, okay? Because I'm making him think, okay? So the queen does indeed retreat to d1. So that is now one, two, three queen moves, nothing to show for it, king still not castled, down to still development of only two, right? Again, this bishop is still technically pinned, absolutely pinned, can't move. So, we need more threats, okay? So, now bishop f5. So, I'm putting two attackers, quite simply, well, three attackers actually, because it's a discovery from the rook as well. Three attackers on the d3 pawn, okay? Now, it's defended only by the queen, because this guy is pinned. Can't do nothing. And um, when it's three against one, there's no more discovered defences. There's nothing white can do. The pawn will fall, potentially. So, um, brings out the dark square bishop now. So, that's some development, at least. But this bishop is going to fall. And I decide to capture here with the knight. Now, I've got options. I could capture with the bishop as well. right? If I capture with the bishop... It doesn't come with check, and white may simply calmly castle, right? Um, yeah, I'm kind of hitting the knight, I'm kind of hitting the bishop. So, yeah, but, hang on, yeah. So if I capture with the bishop, he simply castles, let's say, oh, I take the bishop, queen takes, and gets out of the line of the rook. So there's nothing really gained, but knight takes is more forcing, it's a check, there's nothing more forcing than a check. He has to respond. <clears throat> so bishop takes. It's the only move, yeah? Because if king moves, I grab another pawn with a double attack on the queen. King's lost castling rights. There's no payoff for white. He's got to trade, okay? And now I take with a bishop again. Why the bishop? Yeah, I mean, if I take him with a rook, I'd be attacking the queen. Queen would have to move, fair enough. But t capturing with a bishop means the bishop's looking at f1 and white cannot castle, right? So he can't castle, and I'm also threatening discoveries against the queen. So I could just grab this pawn, for example, hit the queen, my rook's defended by the king, all good. So he has to break this, right? But it doesn't really solve his problem because the pawn still falls, because the knight's now pinned itself. Right? Anytime you block an attack, block a line of sight attack, you're pinning a piece, effectively, right? So, I'm now actually up a pawn. Having sacrificed the pawn early on in the game to get the development advantage, the pressure that I've been able to exert has now meant that I'm actually now in a material advantage. Plus, my king is castled, yeah? And I've got three pieces out on the board. So, I am very much on the front foot. All right. Now he brings out his queen, okay? So, he's got two attackers on, on this pawn here. Um, so, I have a little think and simply calmly drop the bishop back to here, okay? Still preventing him from castling. Now, he goes long. Dude goes long, right? Now, what I really want to do is I really want to give a check here, but I can't because his bishop is actually in quite a good situation. Also looking at this hanging pawn on a7. He goes on, now, what do I have to do? Okay, it's the same story. Yes, I really want to develop this bishop. So now, as soon as he castles this way, he's put his king in space, yeah? But, in natural fact, he's not too exposed. What I would like to do, at some point, is fianchetto this bishop, probably. Target b2. Um, connect my rooks, maybe bring this rook over. 
But I've got a one pawn advantage as well. Where is my one pawn advantage? Charlie the sea pawn. White doesn't have one. All right, so now knight d5. Okay, so I'm attacking this bishop. A very, very important piece for white right now. Um, I'm also threatening maybe to come here, hit the queen. So the bishop grabs a seven. Now, I'm not sure this was a great move from white. Yeah, he's down to three minutes on the clock. And what he's done is he's he's lashed out and grabbed a pawn. Um, but has he improved his situation in any way? Has he um, protected his king, right? I'm not sure that's going to help him. Because my bishop is quite happy here. It's, you know, linked to this pawn. Queen's not going to get come in and cause trouble anytime soon. And this bishop, I mean, it's still on the same diagonal. It hasn't really changed anything, yeah? So, oop. So, now I play knight to b4. Knight is defended by my queen. Um, I've got ideas of coming here with check. I've got ideas of capturing on there possibly, right? But in general, your knights just want to be creeping up the board towards your opponent's king, controlling squares around your opponent's king. That's the action area. White is now forced to kick. Now, white is now down to 24 seconds on the clock. I've got seven minutes. Okay. Just drop him back. Drop him back. We saw this in yesterday's videos. You know, come in, poke at a weakness, force a concession, retreat. You know, it's psychologically as well. I think it's quite powerful that say, oh, I've just made you do something you really didn't want to do. And uh, now you're going to have to live with it. Okay. So, Queen g4 check. And now it gets interesting. Well, I mean, it's all been interesting. Queen g4 check. And here the bishop suddenly comes to life because my king can't move out of check. So I have to block. Rook d7. Okay. Now this guy's getting 10 seconds every time he moves. So he now retreats his bishop because, I, you know, clearly he's worried about b6, king b7 to win the bishop. So it's a classic trap. So he thinks, let's get the bishop the heck out of there. Now I plan to fianchetto my bishop. So what I'm thinking about is, can't make a mistake, right? This is an increment game. I can't, you know, if I give him a sudden advantage, remember this rook is pinned and remains pinned for a while. If I, if I let him in, 10 seconds per move is enough, right? You know, we've all played like the three minute blitz. It's possible to play a decent game in, in, in that time. Not your best chess, but a decent game. And certainly possible to win or complete or convert a, a one end game with three minutes on the clock or 10 minutes, 10 seconds per move. So, so I'm thinking, okay, fianchettoing this bishop is no bad thing. It allows me to bring my rook over, reinforce this rook, maybe get my king the hell out of the way. Okay, out comes his rook. Now, clearly, red lights start flashing. He's thinking about discoveries against my queen. So I have to think, where could his bishop go and cause trouble? Well, he hasn't got a check because my king's on a light square. Right, so bishop could go there, maybe could go there. Double attack on the queen. This one doesn't work because I just capture, reinforced by my own queen as well. Um, this one here again, I'd probably go there. So I'm not too fussed. So I just bishop g7, right? Carry on with the plan. There's no immediate threat, okay? Now a bishop comes here, looking at my bishop and the rook behind it, right? And this is not the time to do silly things. This is why the increment is so important. It makes you play better chess, okay? So what do I do? If I move the bishop, my rook falls, yeah? Not very good. So. I retreat the queen now to f8. <clears throat> Bishop takes, queen takes. All right, fair enough. Material is actually equal. Um, so why not? You know, he might as well trade down. He's getting himself 10 seconds per move. Okay, now my rook is still pinned and it's defended only by the king. He has a queen here and he's also got a rook on the d file. So what does he do? brings the knight in, OK? 
okay? And now it's time to tread with care, okay? So what, would, what move would you make in this situation? I think rook d8 is certainly tempting. This bishop's looking a bit awkward right now. But what I played was f5, break the queen's line of sight down here, break the pin on the rook, and it comes with a fork on queen and knight. Queen retreats. Now, big question, do we capture the knight? Well, if I capture the knight, there's two attackers on this rook, and there's two defenders on this rook. So I figure free stuff. Take the knight. You know? That's potentially quite a good knight. It's quite an annoying piece, right? And I'm going up in material, so why not? Rook takes pawn. Rook h to d8. And now I've got ideas of this. However, of course, still pinned. Right? The queen is still looking down at my king. There's two attackers on this. There's currently three defenders. So now my king can theoretically move out of the way. Now this is an interesting move and I have to think now for nearly three minutes after this one. Knight g5 and immediately I notice that he's coming in for a fork on queen and rook. Okay, so I have to think this one through. If he comes in there and forks that, yeah, am I going to lose material? And eventually, and I'm, I'm figuring out all kinds of permutations. Eventually, I figure out actually, if he does that, yeah, then the queen is no longer attacking this rook. Okay, so currently, what he's done, yeah, so currently my, my rook is pinned, but if he, if he plays this move, my rook is no longer pinned. So, I play my knight to here. Figuring if rook takes knight, I take back the queen, okay? And the knight is defending this rook. Now what white does, low on time, comes in anyway. And now, can you see the next move? My rook is no longer pinned. Rook takes d1 check, right? King to here. And this is really nice kind of final move, uh, four sequence. Rook eight to d2 check. And the king has to move to the third rank. Okay, check again with a fork on king and queen. King moves here. Do we grab the queen? Hell no, right? Queen d7, check again. And white here resigns because he can't go there. He can't go there. His only moves, I think, are that and that. And then the queen, whatever happens, the queen's going to come into b5. And uh, that will be checkmate. So lovely, lovely finish to that. But more than that, what I'm really proud of in that game is really taking on the gambit spirit, right? And um, finding creative ways to keep the pressure on, keep my boot on his neck the whole game. And uh, to his credit, my opponent did you know, work really hard to find some counterplay particularly when he was low on time. He, he dug deep and he did find some good moves. So, you know, full credit to my opponent, but uh, hugely, hugely satisfying win. Um, hope it's inspiring for you. Hope it's been interesting. Hope it's been fun. Thanks for watching. See you later.